base here. The Eagle has landed. Man on the moon. <laughs> Project Apollo and Apollo 11, more specifically, it was the first live global television broadcast in history, and people from all around the world were able to watch. And we're getting a picture on the TV. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. The estimates are between 500 and 600 million people were tuning in their television sets, and then the millions more following it on the radio or newspapers, so half the world's population was following the flight. While the world watched and celebrated the three brave men of Apollo 11, there was a relatively unheralded group back on Earth who made this a success, a group that was not lost on the astronauts in their broadcast back home from space. All this is possible only through the blood, sweat, and tears of a number of people. To all those, I would like to say thank you very much. At its peak, NASA estimates more than 400,000 engineers, scientists, computer programmers, and manufacturers contributed to putting man on the moon. While the world would know the names Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins, unsung heroes who dedicated years of work would be the guiding force to make the giant leap a reality. We had a commitment that was being made at the national level that we were going to the moon with men and return them. We all thought that was a rather ambitious program, but we all had a great deal of confidence. Sonny Maria has a long career of being a problem solver behind the scenes. I said to myself, we can do this. We just got to find a way. And we found that way. Maria was critical to overcoming the engineering challenges of incorporating the engines that would be powerful enough to take man to the moon. His team helped solve the F1 engine combustion instability problem solve the J-2 engine problem and develop the lunar roving vehicle that would fly on Apollo 15, 16, and 17. I tell people I'm the project manager who developed the engines to get the astronauts to the moon. When they got there, I had a car for the last three missions that they could drive and they didn't have to go through a rental agency to get one. <laughs> people like Jim Odom. He was the second stage manager for the Saturn V. I was in charge of engineering and testing of the second stage. NASA relied on legacy employees like Odom, who not only managed a critical part of the Saturn V rocket, but would continue on as a project manager for the space shuttle, the Hubble telescope, and the International Space Station, twice earning presidential commendations for his work. The sheer gratification of having met the president's desire for that milestone was outstanding. If you look at the photographs, the majority of the people who worked on Project Apollo, they're white men. That being said, there were a significant number of women who are contributing and minorities who are contributing as well. Just before landing on the moon was the most exciting part, for some of us at least. Three minutes before Armstrong and Aldrin touched down on the moon, Apollo 11's lunar lander alarms triggered. Red and yellow lights across the board. Our astronauts didn't have much time, but thankfully they had Margaret Hamilton. All of a sudden, the priority alarms came on, 12.01 and 12.02. And I knew that those alarms came on when there was an emergency, and they had no business going on right then. A young MIT scientist and a working mother in the 60s, Hamilton led the team that created the software for the Apollo guidance computer that was able to decipher the emergency code and avoid a mission abort. Eagle looking great. Your go. I like to say not only was it the first human on the moon, but the first software to run on the moon. In 2016, Hamilton earned the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor for her work on Apollo 11. She was also a pioneer when it came to being a woman in the working place and as a software engineer. I was the only woman in the beginning in, in the field. There was a tremendous element of just human hard work that went into the Apollo program. The ones that I remember more than any other were the people who were putting together the space suits. You would see a room of these women bent over doing manual labor with great precision, slowly putting this suit together for Neil Armstrong. And you know, if one of them slipped just a little bit, he'd go out and say, there's one small, uh, wait a minute. Uh, you know, they, his life was dependent on the quality of their work. 
Katherine Johnson, whose tremendous work was encapsulated in the Oscar-nominated 2016 film Hidden Figures, was renowned for her work as a human computer throughout the Apollo missions, including calculations for the trajectory of Apollo 11. After Sputnik in 1950, people began to really think about that problem for the first time in terms of uh, race, but in terms of gender as well. That created a, a paradigm shift in the way people thought. And we can no longer sit back and try to solve problems with the same group of people that have always tried to solve problems. Through the Apollo program, doors were opened and future generations were inspired. I stayed glued to the television set. I can always remember saying, you know, I really want to be a part of that. It was 11 years later I was starting my career at NASA. So I get emotional when I kind of think about it because the likelihood of me in 1969 being a part of something like that is was about as far as way the moon itself. Only a few get a chance to be the astronauts, and they are a special group, no doubt about it. But there's a special group of people, too, the inside of this agency that drives it, that makes all of those things happen. The people behind Apollo were up for every challenge along the way but two elements would constantly remain at odds, technology versus time. Could America develop the technology needed in the time allotted? Well, the Saturn program was always gonna be a massive undertaking that would not have been possible without President Kennedy's declaration. The presidential support gave the Apollo program the resources it needed to be successful. The United States spent $25 billion on it, which today would be roughly $180 billion. The national backing was crucial, but with it came pressure. Constant pressure, constant. Well, at that point, I had not had a vacation with my family for over 10 years. Without that team, this mission never would have made successful. You had hundreds of thousands of people across the country committed to Kennedy's goal, and they didn't want it to be their fault that that goal wasn't met. The first technological challenge was creating a launch vehicle powerful enough to get man to the moon. The eventual solution was the Saturn V. The Saturn V rocket, which put us into orbit, is an incredibly complicated piece of machinery. Standing 363 feet tall, weighing over 6 million pounds, the Saturn V still holds the distinction as the only vehicle to carry humans beyond low Earth orbit. At the point of Kennedy's promise, the most powerful rocket engine could produce 188,000 pounds per thrust. Werner von Braun's team and NASA calculated they would need nearly 10 times that power to get man to the moon. Thus, the F-1 rocket was conceived. The F-1 was absolutely necessary to propel as large a vehicle as we needed to design to go to the moon with three men. The first stage of the Saturn V consisted of a cluster of five F-1 rockets that would produce over seven and a half million pounds of thrust needed to quickly escape the Earth's orbit. It is still today the most powerful rocket engine NASA has ever flown, but its development had many challenges. We had a great deal of trepidation about being able to do it, and especially when our major problem showed up in the, on the F-1 engine, which was a case of combustion instability. Combustion instability, or in essence, an unpredictable possibility that the rocket could explode. The lives of those astronauts depended on, on what I said, and that, that all gets to you. It took about two years of trial and error to finally get the F-1 engine stabilized. We never understood it, but we found a way to counteract it. Once the F-1 engines did their job, the first stage was dispatched, and the job of the second stage was to propel the Apollo spacecraft even further into space. As JFK's deadline loomed, NASA was forced to adopt drastic, groundbreaking measures to increase productivity. Normally, we like to fly the first stage, get it working, then fly the first and second stage and get it working, and then add the third stage. But uh, we were running out of time. NASA headquarters came up with the notion of what we call an all-up. We would put the first Saturn V all live stages at one time. It was a bold move that had never been done before. In my judgment, probably one of the biggest decisions from a vehicle standpoint that were made, and having done it, it allowed us to meet the schedule. Manufacturing a capable launch vehicle was only part of the challenge. Creating a way to guide the Apollo spacecraft was the other. Much of the computer and software technology needed was being invented in real time. The Apollo guidance computer was the most intricate and complex 
control computer and navigation computer that existed at the time. Apollo's computer took advantage of every burgeoning breakthrough in technology. It was one of the first computers to rely on integrated circuits, or microchips, which allowed for a more compact, lighter computer. The digital computer development was brand new. We had to work within the weight limits that the Saturn boosters could put into orbit. The Apollo guidance computers were relatively small, weighing a mere 70 pounds, but by today's standards, very rudimentary. The amount of memory in a Saturn rocket and Apollo capsule is less than what I got in my cell phone. Back then, uh, computers were programmed using punch cards. that They ran one program at a time. We take for granted how our computers today can easily switch from one program to another. Multitasking had to be invented for Apollo. This level of computer programming was the beginning of an industry. There was no field in what we did in software engineering, but what, that's what we were doing without realizing that it was a field. Before the Apollo program, vehicles were not regularly controlled by computers. The airplanes at the time uh, were pulleys and hydraulics. You had a pilot who actually pulled on a lever and a pulled on a lever, and those actually actuated things. And so it was the first time that you had a digital flight control system that a human life depended on and that could successfully control a platform as complex as the Apollo spacecraft were. And there was little margin for error. It had to be reliable. It had to not only work, but it had to work the first time. And in the end, through the people and the technology, it all worked. It's great to look back, perhaps what is one of the greatest human achievements in engineering ever, ever done. How they were able to do that with such little computing capability is it's amazing.